And now, on the lens. He had one season to prove his worth. Game on, game on. On, to his colleagues, his family, himself. He's the best coach in, in the queue, clearly. Follow hockey coach Ted Nolan's dramatic return to the game. We're here tonight, boys. We're... The year he leads the Moncton Wildcats to the Memorial Cup. We just had a coach turn down an NHL offer for us. Here's what we're going to do for him. Here's what we're going to do for each other. Ted Nolan, Behind the Bench. Directed by Matthew Welsh. Back. We can get some more people out here as well for interviews. Ten years ago, Ted Nolan was on the rise in the National Hockey League. The Aboriginal head coach was cocky and unorthodox with a blue collar work ethic. In just two seasons, he led the struggling Buffalo Sabres to their best finish in 16 years. He was named NHL Coach of the Year. It's unbelievable. And then he disappeared from the league. Fans were left to wonder whatever happened to Ted Nolan. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to push back and bring Ted out. If we can all push backwards. Sometimes you go through rough waters, and in order to understand something, you have to go through it first. I went through that uh, period of darkness for a reason. Do I recommend someone going through it? No, not a chance. It's not a very pleasant place to be. rumors about him coming back in the NHL it was going to be with Calgary with the Rangers there's been a, a whole plethora of rumors over the years which NHL city was going to come back in and here he comes back in Moncton <laughs> I mean who would have predicted that he had many many offers and opportunities to return to the game and there was always that gap of information as to where has been Ted Nolan and all of a sudden he surfaces in Moncton so when you have a person that leaves the game at the top of it uh, and doesn't surface until you get to a Memorial Cup year in Moncton and Brunswick. There's mystery, mystique. And they bring in a guy that's been away from the game for eight years. So, I mean, thoughts going through some of the guys' minds are, can this guy step up to the plate and fill the shoes that he's expected to? Can he come in and do the job that people want him to do? After his rise and fall in the National Hockey League, Ted Nolan wanted to get back to his place as a top-level coach. He expected more NHL offers, but they never came. Well, over the last uh, nine years, there's a lot of job vacancies came available, and, and a lot, uh, a lot had my name attached to them. But no one's going here, no one's going there, and, and nothing really, uh, really significant uh, came my way. And all of a sudden, I was just sitting down about a month before, I was sitting down to my wife and said, you know what, what I should do is just officially retire and, yeah, because I was really uh, enjoying what I was doing at the time. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, two weeks later, I get a call from Mr. Irving. It was one of those weird moments in life where you think you got hockey out of your system, but down deep inside, there was a burning desire to get back. Ted signs a contract with the Moncton Wildcats of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. This year, the Memorial Cup, Canada's Junior Hockey Championship, will take place in Moncton, New Brunswick for the first time. As host team, the Wildcats are guaranteed a spot at the tournament next spring. But some fear they won't be ready. They struggled last season, and there's talk in the league that they could be an embarrassment. The pressure is on Ted to rebuild the team and prove he's still a winner. Guy you're asking to put the team together and make the trades to build a winner here 
has no experience in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, doesn't know the league, how's he going to know the players and the other teams? So there's some concerns there. How is he going to make out after eight years on the sidelines, and does he still have what it takes? Does he still have it from his old Buffalo days? But he's getting a premier defenseman now. How about this? He wants to know how about, how about this? Thing? How about a first in 2008? If, if the guy plays for us. Yeah, if he plays for us 2008, he had first round pick. At the draft, deals and trades don't come easily. Ted takes some risks and brings in 14 new players. Most are unknowns from outside the league. And for some, this is the best shot they've ever had. I didn't know where I was getting into. I didn't know any players. I didn't uh, manage before in my life. Uh, I didn't coach in 10 years. So uh, was I nervous? You bet I was. Um, was I scared? You certainly, you certainly was. And I think, uh, I think that's one of the motivating factors for myself that helped me get through. If you, if you go through without fear, um, fear is a good thing. Uh, but as long as it's uh, controlled fear. Uh -oh. Ted finds players with skill. Oh, that was a goal. But more importantly, players with passion. Number 28, veteran, Chris Give him that, and he'll build a team that feels more like a family. My philosophy as a, as a coach is definitely uh, the philosophy that I, that I grew up with, that everybody's important. There's, uh, I'm from a family of uh, 12. I got six brothers and five sisters, and, and I always thought I was the most special one of the whole group. And then all of a sudden I heard my sister tell her friends that she thought she was and, and so forth right down the line. And, and the one thing I learned at a very early age that, that everybody's treated equally and fairly and, and loved the same way. Ted grows up in Garden River, a small Ojibwa First Nation community near Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. From an early age, hockey makes the cold northern winters something to look forward to. And I, and I still remember the, the first pair of skates we ever had was, they're a little bit big. I think they were maybe size seven or eight or whatever they were. My feet were probably size three. And you just put, uh, put the rubber boots on those ones with the red, uh, red on the bottom and big uh, winter socks and you put them inside and it uh, tighten them up real, real tight. And uh, they were almost like skis versus skates, but uh, you just flopped around on those for a while. And, and I never really had a pair of brand new pair of skates until I was, uh, I think, 16, 17 years old. Ted creates his own rink every winter, but the Nolan house has no running water, so Ted has to flood his rink using the hand pump at the well, one pail of water at a time. We all played hockey, right? My brothers and sisters, Ted and I, when we started in the Sioux, we had to share gloves and, and a helmet and stick every time we got off the ice. It was different shifts from each other, right? So he was, you know, he could skate a little bit, play a little bit, and so every time he go off, he'll drop his gloves, take his helms off and give me the stick and I'll go my turn. I can just imagine all those non-native parents would say, oh, look at those cute little Indian kids out there have to share their equipment, right? Never once in my entire life ever thought I was a poor kid. I just thought, you know, that's that's just the work we'd had and, and, and you learn to deal with what you got and, and to, to work with what you have. In Moncton, Ted's working with what he's got and his comeback has begun. Ted starts the season with the Wildcats on a five-game winning streak. Well, here's a shot, another shot right in front, scores! The Wildcats pick it up and it looked like Mark Hart was the guy who finally... Unlike a lot of coaches, Ted rolls all four lines on his bench, not just the top two or three. Cadet, your line's up. Cadet's up. For Ted, star players don't carry a team. Keep rolling four lines and eventually you wear the other team out. Right away, Willie. Right away. No, no. Whoa! Make them pay, boys. You want to do that stuff? Make them pay. Ted's Wildcats are gritty, but not dirty. They score plenty, and they fight when they have to. 
When Ted was a player at the junior level back in 1975 in Kenora, Ontario, fighting for respect started at the first practice. Anybody who leaves home at an early age is obviously is going to have, have that uh, homesickness at the beginning. But when you add a little bit of racism and name calling on top of it, it's a little bit tougher. You go to hockey practice and you, you get a uh, hey, wagon burner. And all of a sudden you get the spear across the gut and all of a sudden this big guy wants to, wants to fight with you. I never fought so much hockey in my life. Uh, the first two, three days of practice, and I was just trying to go for my, the team I was supposed to play with. Two of Ted's brothers make the trip to Kenora to see how he's doing. They find their brother losing his passion for the ice. Not only is he fighting at practice, but also the hometown crowd yells racist taunts at games. Enough, you know? Like, there's, there's a couple ways you can do this, is, is you keep fighting and enjoying yourself doing it, or just leave. I always remember my father telling me to, to be proud of who I was and to, uh, to be strong. And you know, all of a sudden, you're, you're going through a, uh, a situation like that where uh, it wasn't good anymore. It, it wasn't very much fun. All of a sudden, uh, you know, you're by yourself. And so when they asked me to hop in the car with them, uh, that's when I, uh, I just said, no, I'll stay. And the thing is, he's never a quitter. Never a quitter. Never. I, I fought through it, and um, all of a sudden next year I, I played with the Sioux Greyhounds, had a chance to play with uh, Wayne Gretzky and Craig Hartsburg and Greg Mellon, and a year later get drafted in the National Hockey League. Ted is drafted by the Detroit Red Wings. He's a journeyman player who plays much of his seven-year pro career in the American Hockey League. But he dresses for 80 games in the NHL with the Red Wings and the Pittsburgh Penguins. I couldn't stick handle very well, I couldn't skate very well, I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the toughest. I and mean, I told that to my son one day, he said, well, what, how the heck do you ever make it in the first place? Uh, because I, I wanted to. Ted becomes a hero back home in Garden River and a role model for Aboriginal kids across Canada. I realize now I'm not going to go into a league and score 50 to 60 goals. And I work on what I'm good at and what's going to get me to the next level. And realizing that Ted has done that as a player, I know that there's room for people like that in the game. When Ted was hired by the Wildcats, he brought assistant coach Danny Flynn along with him. That means you don't stand out here, the guy's covering you, you got to go low. When the puck comes up here, this left Their chemistry goes back to Ted's early coaching days. In 1986, an injury forces Ted to retire as a player. But soon after, he's hired to coach his old junior team, the Sioux Greyhounds. Under Ted, the team finishes at the bottom of the league for two years running, and the fans want a new coach. But the general manager gives Ted another shot. He rebuilds the team and adds Danny Flynn to the mix. They take the team to the Memorial Cup tournament three years in a row, winning it all in 1993. Back. It's mid-season and the Wildcats are at the top of the league. But in November, they're handed an embarrassing loss. Coming into a dressing room, any other junior dressing room, any other dressing room in hockey, you're going to have the coach coming in, he's going to be kicking garbage cans and yelling and swearing and totally didn't know what to expect. It was the first time that happened to our team. I still remember when Ted comes in and he's totally calm. And he looks at us with his little grin and starts laughing a little bit because everyone's down in the dumps. And Ted, you know, he says, boys, it's a, it's a learning step. This year isn't based on that third period. This year is based on winning the Mem Cup. And if we have to lose three more games like this to learn that you have to play 60 minutes to win a game, then we'll do it again and we'll do it again. Right now, he's like a second dad to me, you know, he, he helps me a lot, you know, he, he encourages me, you know, he, it's like my dad away from home sort of thing, and he just, 
he's been a real he's been a real help for me since I've been here. My father never had a chance to see me play professional sport, and I didn't really realize how much he thought I was a good player. Um, he didn't really tell me. He just kind of went and watched, and I, I think if he was around, he'd probably, you know, demonstrate to a lot of parents how parents should be with their kids in sports, and just let them enjoy it. And he let me enjoy it, and unfortunately, he uh, passed away when I was 14, 15. That he didn't see that, and, and when I played my first game uh, in the National Hockey League, uh, my mother was even here uh, in 1981. Um, I got a call and, and she was uh, tragically killed in, in a drunk driving accident, so... Uh, uh, that's hard. But. Losing his mother to a hit-and-run drunk driver is devastating for Ted. But the sense of pride and place that he learns from both his mother and father remains. Ted's in town, you usually see him like jogging around the block or he goes to the store and everybody knows when Ted, when Teddy comes home because, you know, so you usually get a phone call or see him running and it's, and I'm sure he notices that when he's home a lot of people just drive by his house just to see Teddy and it's just really, I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be really proud of myself if I was Teddy Nolan. Well, this is our powwow grounds in, in Garden River, where uh, powwows back in the day and, and still today is, is, a, is a place of, of celebration, uh, a place uh, families can get together and celebrate our, our, our culture and our rich traditions from, uh, from our great-grandfathers all the way down. And, and still, it's really neat to see you know, five-year-olds and four-year-olds uh, getting out here on a, on, a, on, a, on a dance floor and getting their moccasins flying and, and listening to the sound of the drum. This is where I grew up and dancing, and my mom taught me the importance of the, of the drum at a very young age. And we used to call it the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And we danced to the mother's uh, heartbeat, and that's in the form of a drum now. go to all the powwows and sit around and we used to have talking circles and you just listen to people talk and all of a sudden you, you hear them uh, tell stories about what happened uh, um, in, in the 40s and 50s and uh, residential schools and some of the hurts and pains that they went through and and um, my uncle I, I still never forget it we, he had a he had some problems and uh, he, uh, he was an alcoholic and uh, we went to his house one time and uh, he was just coming off to, off a two-week, uh, two-month bender or whatever, and I still remember he was going through the dry heaves and he was sicker than a dog and puking and and, and the smell inside the house. And I was only eight years old, and uh, my mom took me over to help, you know, hold his arms once in a while to because uh, he was getting you know violently sick. And all of a sudden I come walk, walking out of that house one time and I'm going, you know, ain't, ain't, this ain't gonna happen to me. Now the OHL though, you watch there, top players yeah, play. Yeah, Jordan, you know, hey, this is you your gotta, year. You gotta play hard. You gotta figure out why, if they don't play you, you gotta figure out why they're not playing you. And you know what though, Jordan, with anything, it's communication. But which is good that you did go, just go talk to your coaches. If you don't like something, if you don't understand anything, just go ask them. They'll appreciate that. Just don't do it. Mommy told me to do when I turned pro. What's that? What did I tell you to do? Yeah, well, coach is the coach is picking on me. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in my second year pro in 
in Glens Falls, New York, uh, playing with the Adirondack Red Wings. One of the coaches were making fun of my stick handling during practice. Started chopping up the pockets and rice, and all the other guys were laughing at him. And he was demonstrating Nolan's stick handling school of uh, stick handling. He was whacking the puck and beating it up, and all the guys were laughing. I didn't, I didn't know what to do except for charge a guy and and take a swing at him, and, and that's what I did. And that's a coach, and and that's a big taboo in in, in a coaching field that I wouldn't recommend anybody doing it. Remember that night we went out? Okay. The manager called the house and said, coach wants to take you out and straighten up the situation. Okay, so that was really good, right? Went out next day, power play. <laughs> it's funny, the people you battle with all the time end up being your best yeah. allies later. Yeah. Because even when I went to Kenora, one of the worst guys on the team always, he was a big guy. When I first got there, we... He got the better of me a couple times. Then uh, towards the end of the year, we became pretty good friends. Watching the other teams getting the scouting report. <laughs> All the fans are turned down. Respect for yourself, your family, and your team. Through Ted, this year, Josh Hepditch is gaining new respect for his own Aboriginal roots. He's just starting to learn more about his Inu grandmother from Labrador. To have pride in that, where, um, where I come from, the native background, it's, it's always disrespected by some people and it's always bullied by some people, but to see where he's come from and to see what he's done with it just gave me a little bit of light to see what, what I could do with it. It gave me inspiration in a way where I totally want to show him the kind of person I am and the kind of player that I am and also be the same, on the same page as him in a way where, I mean, uh, and the stuff that he taught me about his native background, he would tell me more about my native background in a way too. It's the last game before the Christmas break, a road game in Chicoutimi, Quebec. While the Wildcats are battling for first place on the ice, Ted finds himself fighting another battle he thought was long over. The nation is shocked by what happens that night. It certainly wasn't everybody in the stadium, but it was about two to three hundred fans, and they were uh, dressed in head feathers. They were doing the Indian war, Native war cries, you know, rain dances around the bunken bench, and uh, sh pretending to shoot bow and arrows at head coach uh, Ted Nolan. And it was a, it was a brutally ugly scene. It felt like it was it was us, you know what I mean? Like making fun of us. We're all in this together, so it just felt like they were doing those comments towards us. So yeah, we felt it too. To see our coach be humiliated and disgraced and, I mean, disrespected like this, it was something that it was one of the hardest things to do to keep your cool. And to see Ted keep his cool the way he did and act as professional as he did in that situation was really hard for us to swallow where we wanted to do something to stop it, but we couldn't. It was almost like everything that we accomplished in the first half of the season dropped because of one game. It was probably harder to understand as a 47-year-old understanding what, how could people of this age in 2006 continue to, to be like that. So it was, it was hard. It was probably the, uh, one of the most difficult situations I've ever been to in, in my entire life. And when he called, he said, he said he'd never seen anything like it. Never. He, he, says he, was, he said it was worse than Kenora. I said, whoa, that's pretty bad. Ted uses the time over the Christmas break to recover from the humiliation in Chicoutimi. Then in January, he gets the phone call he's been waiting for for years. The New York Islanders in the NHL want him as head coach for the rest of this season. Charles Wang did call me right after Christmas. He offered me the job to go to Long Island during the winter time to leave the, leave the team. Um, I chose not to. I made a commitment to the Monkey Wildcats for the complete season, not two quarters or three quarters the way through.
In the 1990s, Ted more than proves he belongs in the NHL. Nolan's Buffalo Sabres are known as the hardest working team in the league. In just two seasons, he turns the fortunes of the team around and makes them a surprise contender in the playoffs. Ted's a popular coach with most of his players, but he and the team's star goaltender, Dominic Hasek, don't see eye to eye on team strategy. Ted's relationship with his general manager, John Muckler, is stormy, and Muckler gets fired. Despite the tensions, Ted, at age 39, is named NHL Coach of the Year in 1997. Wow. I'm just really, really thrilled to be right here. And there's a lot of people in my life that, uh, that helped along the way. And... For the next season, the Buffalo Sabres offer only a one-year contract. Ted gets the feeling they don't want him. He turns the contract down. I don't know what it was. I mean, it's just one of those things where you're, you're hired to, to unite a team and, and to, to bring them um, to the top place and try to win a Stanley Cup. But I thought I did a pretty good job. Unfortunately, uh, my, the general manager, myself, didn't agree on a couple of issues. Um, the ownership changed, and, and it was just a whole cluster of, of things. And um, the new ownership came in and made changes, which is, which is fine. A few months later, they want him to coach in Tampa Bay, but he turns it down. Because in Florida, his boys won't have a place to play hockey. Ted assumes he'll get other offers, but he doesn't. Some say he's been blackballed in the NHL. Others say it's his own doing. There doesn't seem to be any interest or any offers from any other NHL team since. And the guy has maybe labored in obscurity, but he still had a successful record wherever he's yeah. been. He's, he's the best coach in, in the queue, clearly. Well, one thing about uh, NHL is the general managers and the, the 30 general managers in the NHL, it's an old boys network. Mm -hmm. And if you upset one of them, as he obviously did in Buffalo by turning down their contract and yeah. walking away. A little bit of an old boys network at, at work there. It's extremely an old boys network among the 30 NHL GMs, and if you upset one of them, They've all got their buddies, yeah. and you upset everybody. And I think that's what's, I think Ted Nolan's a classic example of that. I, I still believe to this day that uh, uh, during that period of time that if he was part of the, uh, the majority, as opposed to being a minority, he would have been hired the next day. That's just my personal opinion. That's, and if you can ask probably the Aboriginal population in this country, they'll say the same thing. The saddest part about the whole thing is, you know, you, you hear the rumors. Uh, I'm out of the league now because I'm, I was my asking price for for salaries was too high, or I had affairs with uh, players' wives, or I was drunk uh, too much at uh, going to practice. I I heard every rumor that there was. It's very simple. I'm going to tell you what happened. First of all, he went into war with Muckler, and Muckler got fired. So now you're a GM. You see, he's 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 uh, the, I hate to say it, but he's a GM killer. And so now it's it, you know it's everything's like that, and everything. Plus, he fought with his star. He, well, I don't go that with Hasek. I think he was kind of right in the whole deal and everything. Mm -hmm. Then you have then you have uh, uh, other guys. He he was trying to get f hired by Tampa. He turned it down. You know what I mean? And every time there's one comes up, he puts his name, he gets turned down. It's not that he is uh, uh, racism. It's uh, what happened was that he's tough to fire. And I was so consumed with wondering why I, I, I lost track of who I was. And um, you know, I was a very, uh, very nice man to be around. I used to go to a lot of uh, First Nation communities and talk to the kids about uh, about uh, schooling, about the dangers of substance abuses and, and believing in yourself. And I, and I had to stop that because I, I couldn't get to the point where I believed it anymore. During these years after Buffalo, Ted reconnects with his roots. He's able to spend time with his family without the pressures of an 82-game schedule in the NHL. His sons suddenly have an NHL Coach of the Year on their bench. Ted is hired by the Assembly of First Nations to take a team of young Aboriginal players to an international tournament where they compete as a separate nation against countries like Russia, Finland and Canada. He goes to work on the Rose Nolan Scholarship Fund in honor of the woman who taught him to appreciate his heritage. Soon Ted is comfortable once again as role model for the next generation. Good job.
halfway through the second half of the season, we were, we were on a little bit of a losing streak, and uh, we were told from, from coaches that Ted had a chance to go to the NHL for the second half of the season. It hit you and said, you know, there's no more fooling around. Like, everything's business now. We just had a coach turn down an NHL offer for us. Here's what we're going to do for him. Here's what we're going to do for each other. The Wildcats complete their best season in franchise history under Ted Nolan. They're ranked number one in the Quebec League going into the playoffs. And they're sporting a new blonde look to show they're serious about winning. Come on, Andrew. Come on, I'll be banging out there, so I'll be banging. Get the puck in and attack, and attack, and attack. Keep skating on because they only play two lines. We attack them, they won't have nothing left come the third period. Nothing fancy about trying to beat somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Let's get the puck in. Let's be physical as we can. Short, hard uh, changes. We got everybody rolling. We got everybody playing. And f them. Yeah! A lot of coaches know the X's nose of the game. A lot of them can break down video and, you know, dissect plays and drop game plans and with the X's nose on the chalkboard. I think what separates him is his, uh, his people skills, his motivational skills. He's a, he's a master motivator. He knows how to push buttons to get guys to respond. He understands that you can't paint all players with the same brush. A hug may work with one guy, a kick in the butt may work with another. He, uh, he has the ability to get guys to uh, go through the wall for him. If you want to, if you want to win, if you truly, truly want to win, there's prices you have to pay. Boys, winning teams always do things that losing teams don't want to do. We can come here and have a 15-minute feel-good practice, get, make sure, because we're, we're maybe a little bit sore. F*** the f***ing being sore shit. We're only out for 45 minutes. Let's work at it. We're going to have a couple days off here in a few days. But right now, we got work to do. So let's make sure we concentrate. Let's not say, well, let's get this thing over with so I can go back in the whirlpool, get my hair all fancy. Let's work. Let's work. Okay, let's start all over again. Get back, get back, get back, get back! Drive it, goop! Drive it, drive it, drive it, drive it! Regroup, regroup! Come on, torch! Torch, that's why you gotta get your... get your brain on the small little things. Get your brain on the small things, right? There. Don't just throw the puck up there. Well, like last night, you, you, you mishandled the puck there last night, too, by just thinking. Look, watch everything go and grab it, control it, push it up. Get your head into it. He, he tells it how it is. If, you, if you're doing bad, he's going to let you know. If you're doing good, he's going to let you know. And, you know, he's just, he's just so uh, straight up forward with you. And uh, I think that's, that's um, one of the best qualities in a coach and in a person that you can have, you know, just someone who's an honest, honest coach. The Moncton Wildcats make it all the way to the finals against the Quebec City Ramparts, coached by fiery Hall of Fame goaltender Patrick Waugh. It's Patrick's rookie year as head coach, and the rivalry with Ted begins before the first puck drops, with a little trash talk in the press. 
Ted says Patrick uses his NHL reputation to influence referees. Patrick says Ted's team is ranked number one this year only because they play in a less competitive division. Four games go into overtime. Here's Brad Marchand. Marchand back to the point. Carson's trying to come in for the top goal. And they have a two -game lead. The Wildcats win the series in six for their first ever Quebec League championship. We finally knew that we were going into the Mem Cup through the front door. We earned our way there. We just weren't going there as a host. To see Ted lift that cup and the smile that he had for us, knowing that he's proven a point and that everyone's doubts were obviously gone. The new Quebec League champs will go on to face the winners from the West and Ontario in the Memorial Cup. Patrick's Ramparts also head to the tournament as runner-up to the host Wildcats. He says the battle for the real prize is yet to come. Four teams are in town for the Canadian National Junior Hockey Championship. The Wildcats have known since the start of the year that they'd be here. But Ted got them here as champions of the Quebec League. still remember the first face-off, how loud the rank was and the, the goosebumps that go through your body waiting for that puck to drop. I remember Vancouver being in our zone for a minute and a half, two minutes, and we're just trying to hold on for, for dear life. I grab the puck, and I know that, you know, I know I'm going to get hit, and my mind's everywhere. I throw the puck in the middle, and it stays in our zone for another 15, 20 seconds. Top rookies in the Western League, accepts a pass backhander. He scores! Michael Rappick, and 117 into the opening period of the Giants. Coming off the ice and sitting down on the bench and seeing Ted come down and saying, you're like a deer in headlights out there, wake up. That's a routine play. We prepared for that all season. You know you're better than that. You know what to do in that situation. It was just such a wide awakening for us and for me personally. Josh and the team take the wake-up call from Ted. They beat Vancouver and Peterborough and advance to the Memorial Cup final. Waiting for them is their Quebec League rival, the Quebec Ramparts. Wildcats players are saying that they're looking for some revenge out there on the ice tomorrow morning. Nolan's saying that he's looking for redemption. Your thoughts? Not us. We're not talking about revenge. It's, uh, it's a big game for us, and uh, I think if somebody should talk about revenge, it's probably us. This is as much about Nolan versus Wall as it is about the Ramparts versus the Wildcats. At least that's the way it's been hyped up all week because there's been so much animosity between those two individuals. Patrick Waugh tells media that Wildcats goalie Josh Torgman is in over his head and is going to choke sooner or later. Yeah, there is... My game is played in the NHL, and, and the ones who are going to succeed and they're going to make it, they deserve to be ready, and I think this is part of it. If you tell a kid he can't do it, uh, eventually he's going to believe it. And if you tell a kid that he could do it, he will. And to try to use words to, to deflect that away from some kid's dreams and the uh, uh, young man's uh, aspirations, uh, it's not very good. Rampar is the French word for defensive wall. If the guys are going to go through a wall for Ted, this is it. Dupuis 
It's 4 nothing at the end of 40 minutes. Then Moncton star defenseman Keith Yandel cranks out two goals in the third. He scores! And it looks like momentum is shifting. The Wildcats outshoot the Ramparts 48 to 25. But it's not enough. The run for the cup is over. everything we had to, to give and uh, sometimes the score doesn't necessarily indicate you lost. Uh, I thought we gave what we had to give and uh, that's all you can ask for. What did you think of your guys tonight? What did you think? I, I, thought, we, uh, I thought we played well. I mean, uh, a couple costly turnovers at the beginning and uh, there were big turnovers and, and that's going to happen. Ted, a lot of people said that this was your road back to coaching into the NHL. Does this ruin those chances at all? Brad Marchand and Mac Marquardt get drafted into the National Hockey League. Josh Heptich is going to play at university, but he still hopes for that shot at the NHL one day. And Ted Nolan? He gets another call from the New York Islanders. After nine years, he's back on the bench in the NHL. <laughs> and I didn't go back to Moncton to get back in the National Hockey League. But I wanted to go back one year, have some fun doing it, get that passion back. And uh, the first week on the job, I, I found out that I did have the passion. And you know, I think um, that's what led me back to the National Hockey League, maybe, because I, uh, hopefully I'm, I got the job because I'm, I'm good at what I do. Some players are going back next year might wish that he was there another year but everyone is totally happy for Ted to sign that contract. It's something that we knew we were all part of that season and something that we'll never forget. The New York Islanders have been struggling the last few years. The pressure is on Ted to rebuild the team and prove himself for one more season. Next time on The Lens.